It was on this date, ladies and gentlemen, in 1971 that the poet Ogden Nash passed away. And if those of you who know even a little bit about poetry probably know at least some about Ogden Nash, known for his humor in poetry. So as a salute to Ogden Nash, I bring you today's intros, and it has nothing to do with this kind of music underneath it. I just kind of grew to like it, <laughs> having used it twice in the last month. So with a sense of humor, at least tried and implied, I bring you first intro of the day. Behold the Schultz, whose name is Larry, and all of that face that is quite hairy. The beard is bushy, the beard is gray. The beard ain't going, it's here to stay. What's the truth behind that beard? Is it not so bad or worse than feared? I'll guess what he's hiding behind that furry facial lump. Could it be that it's his love for Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> it would take a lot more than a face full of hair to hide that. <laughs> I bring you the next man with a law degree. Mike Carl, a fiscally sound man, I do decree. He went to law school with Clarence Thomas, who was showered with gifts and more gifts upon us. So I have to believe that when Mike talks to his friend, it's sound advice he gives, or will better yet lend. If you're a tax lawyer like he is, then you simply must know. Next time, Clarence, report those gifts from Harlan Crow. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Thank you. <laughs> When Mike Heights not racing cars on a Richmond road course, or helping his friend Hornby purchase a horse, or listening to his constituents who are asking a favor, or arguing with DHHR again about an IDD waiver, or going to Charleston and stopping the steal, as in Brandon for Speaker, a pretty big deal, he's here in his seat getting ready to shout, when Donald Trump dies, what will Larry talk about? <laughs> that was literally Mike's third point of discussion today. <laughs> this is the tale of a young Joey Torts who grew up with dreams of working in courts. So he followed his dream, a young boy so skinny, with the goal of one day being like my cousin Vinny. He graduated from law school and bought some new suits, excited to go forth and clear those two utes. But defense work didn't cut it. That's not how it went. Once Joe found out that in a civil case, your take is at least 30%. <laughs> <laughs> Don't undercut it, huh? Don't Joe, undercut they, it. Always, they always leave out the part that we get zero when we lose. <laughs> I am not making this up. When I wrote that punchline, I also wrote down Larry Schultz going to say, they always leave out the part that we don't get paid if we lose. No way I got that 100%. I've gotten that written down somewhere. I'm going to bring that in. I I got that word for word. You're becoming predictable, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> we closed down our rhymes with our seafaring Bill, who, when stopping the ship, could give you a thrill. <laughs> Stubblefield was skilled at captaining the seas, but when it came to the dock, he suffered a squeeze. <laughs> he brought that ship in and on the deck stood quite tall while bending the bow and scratching the hull. And if you think that the ship's mates were scared of a shark, you should see Bonnie when Bill tries to parallel park. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea, Captain. Bad, Bad idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> a salute to Ogden Nash. Passed away this day, 1971. We start with our leadoff hitter, Joe Joey Torts Ferretti. Rob, uh, Henry Ford uh, was asked one time why he was such a big supporter of public education, uh, and, which he did it during his life, and his foundation continues to, even to this day to be a big supporter of public education. When asked why he did that, uh, in a very, uh, I guess, not in a very political, uh, sensitive way, he said, look, I can't have idiots working for me. And I, I thought about that because as we talk about public education these days, we have to realize that uh, the importance of educating our youth so that they are able to come out and be productive members of society, to, to work uh, for others, to work for themselves, to start their own businesses, to maybe work in government and serve others. Uh, you know, this is such an important thing for us, and, and I hope that from teachers' unions to business owners, we understand that educating our youth is critical for the future of this country. Yet, when I see the latest statistics from the National Education Association for the state of West Virginia, despite efforts in the past three or four years where teachers have been given raises, we now rank 50th in teacher pay. 
And when you compare ourselves to our neighboring count, our neighboring states, we are lagging way behind. However, I dug a little deeper into the stats, and I find out that West Virginia is 30th in the amount spent per pupil in our public schools. So the question I have is, and this is something I've been advocating for, that we need a Marshall Plan for our public education in West Virginia. How can we be spending what is an acceptable amount on a per pupil basis for educating our kids in the state of West Virginia, yet have teacher pay at 50th? Where is the money going? And what do we need to do to redirect that money to areas that are clearly needed, which is teacher pay, so that we don't have what is projected to be a 1,700 number, number for teacher shortages in the state of West Virginia this coming school year? How do we get certified teachers in the classroom? How do we recruit? How do we have pay levels that attract them to the state of West Virginia? And how do we reformulate our education system so that the spending we seem willing to make for public education goes in the right direction? All right. Let's start with Delegate Michael Height, who's got some inside knowledge on how the money is spent in the state as a member of the Finance Committee. Well, I guess my first question would be, if, if you look at it not just uh, where are we as far as how much teachers make, how much do they make as a percentage of the cost of living in West Virginia? And when you look at it that, are we still 50th? And and I think the answer is probably not, that the cost of living in West Virginia is a whole lot less than what it is in, in lots of other places um, around the, the country, including Northern Virginia and, and, and the Northeast. So, you know, do teachers in, in Northern Virginia and, and the Northeast make a whole lot more than teachers in West Virginia? Yes, but it also costs a whole lot more to live in those areas, and that's one of the reasons they make more money. West Virginia, the cost of living in West Virginia outside of the Eastern Panhandle is a whole lot less, and, and teachers make less because of that. Now, if you take all that into consideration, and our teachers still are – you know, 30th or, or 40th, then I would say, yes, we have a real problem and we need to invest more into uh, those individuals that educate our kids. But at the same time, we also have to take a, a responsibility to make sure we are in charge of what's being taught to our kids and not just throwing money at it and saying, all right, Department of Education, go educate our kids um, without having some say as to what they're teaching our kids. Bill? Yeah, I'm going to kind of pick up on what uh, Mike Height said. Uh, studies like this, if they're one-dimensional, looking at one thing, uh, can be misleading. Uh, if we're looking at uh, state as a whole, and if we do the average, then the uh, ones in the Eastern Panhandle are even more disadvantaged because the cost of living is here uh, is greater here. Uh, but things like uh, uh, the salary has been addressed, the medical the retirement, the other benefits are not picked up and reflected in a study such as this. Now, to have credibility, all facets, I think, should be addressed, both the quantitative, the ones that can get an easy answer to, and also the qualitative, where there's a soft answer, such as respect that are given to the teachers. Uh, we... Uh, uh, my exposure to the uh, uh, to the Board of Education is primarily through this show and and similar involvement, uh, where there's a lot of criticism directed to our teachers, uh, both at the uh, uh, from the parents uh, f and the legislators. The legislators have frequently said things. They've grouped all the teachers together, and it casts them in a more negative light than I think they should be cast into. So there is a respect issue, but there's also a, I think in this this particular case, a misleading uh, set of numbers because it's fairly, so narrowly focused and driven. We need a broader base to see exactly what the uh, big picture, or the total picture is. I would suspect though, if you do weave in these other aspects, would still be 
fairly low, not 50th perhaps, would still be fairly low. Before I go to the next panelist, Joe, is that study one that included a cost of living index relative to the salary? No, no. It was just, it was simply an empirical study of uh, starting pay and average pay. Larry Schultz. Yes, uh, to go to what Mike was saying, it would be more helpful to have a fuller uh, raft of numbers to to make these comparisons with, but I'm pretty sure that number 49 is Mississippi, and number 48 is a, is another state that we could probably agree in about two minutes, and all of those have fairly low cost of living as well. On the other hand, in New York State, where the pay is very high, if you're a teacher you'd sure much rather live in western New York between Jamestown and Buffalo than in Manhattan. <laughs> because if you're going to pay one money across the board, boy, is it going to cost a lot more to live in Manhattan. So that problem exists everywhere. And still, the quality, you can look at charts of achievement um, among populations, and the money tracks it fairly closely. But I don't. I don't know that in other states or like West Virginia, in in where they all teachers are paid the same across the state. In in many other states, they take it by by region or township or or county or whatever, and then they have the choice of how much the teacher is paid, and then you get a statewide average. So I don't know that teachers in New York and Buffalo are getting paid the same as they are in Manhattan. They're not. The, the, it's done by school district. Sure. And and over time, obviously, that um, sort of evens out. Uh, the problem is um, not only are teachers in the eastern panhandle being hurt by what you're talking about, the cost of living. Teachers all over, there, isn't, there aren't any teachers in West Virginia who are saying, whoopee, you know, uh, we're, we're on the gravy train now, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, my dad was a single school teacher, bringing home one salary, raised five kids, and sent them to college. I know married couple teachers who can neither have a child nor afford to buy a house. Um, we've got to change some of that stuff. I would but, say in, in places like McDowell County, um, they, they do live, live pretty well. If you, if you yeah. have a teacher or two teachers that are living together, you know, a, a couple, they, they live pretty well in McDowell County. Yeah, but not here. No, 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 not here. And, and they you're, can't, you're right. And they can't afford to have a child and own a house. But and, and to, that's, to Mike's point, one of the weaknesses of studies such as this, it groups the state as, as one. Yes. It does not make the recognition. We have the same problem in West Virginia that New York has. Uh, we have the Eastern Panhandle. We have the rest of the state. And New York has New York City and the western part of the state. So studies like this, by definition, are misleading. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I agree with many of these points. Of course, ultimately, this this comparisons that matter are student achievement and we we don't i don't know where 50 is but we're way down there and to me the the number one factor is the institutionally locked in one size fits all system not just on teachers pay but on all management of schools completely and and we have this uh uh immune from legislative input state board of education that thanks to governor justice's opposition to amendment four is still there the whole idea i mean the the absurdity of the argument that that this that to be against uh, um, amendment four was to support local control it's it's just 180 degrees a lie and 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 that's what we need we need more local control, including the setting of teacher salaries. Back to you, Joe. Well, I, two points. Uh, one, when I drive around the Eastern Panhandle and I see businesses trying to attract applicants for jobs, what they advertise is the starting pay. Uh, the, on the billboard is not statistics about cost of living and you know how our real estate taxes are less. They're trying to attract people with starting pay and, and most likely average pay. 
we have seven. We are projected to have seventeen hundred less teachers than we need to man and 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 have our classrooms filled with certified teachers. How are we going to get these people to West Virginia? It's going to have to be pay. And ranking fiftieth is not going to attract the numbers and the kinds of teachers you need to do a good job. So I, I think this is an area that has to be addressed so that we're not 50th. But I'm still struck by the fact that the state is willing to spend on education. We are 30th in per-pupil spending. Where is that money going? Are we bloated with our administrative staff? Do we have too many assistant superintendents and too many people at the state level running education? Where's the top to bottom analysis of that so that that ranking of 30th per pupil spending is making sure that the money is being directed to the people who need it most, the teachers. So I'm hopeful that the legislature will continue to analyze this problem. I don't know that Amendment 4 is the answer or not. I, I, I just I haven't thought enough about that. But I do know that the money's there. It just needs to be directed in the right areas. One of the issues with allowing the counties to be their own school districts in West Virginia is the argument that the smaller counties would then suffer tremendously in their public education because of the lack of population and tax base. But for the most part, where I grew up in Pittsburgh, the borough itself was the tax district for the public schools that were in the district. In Maryland, it's the county that's the tax district for all the schools within the county. In West Virginia, the entire state is the tax district for funding the public schools, which is bad for a large system like Berkeley would be, relatively speaking, but great for a small system because it evens out the smaller schools. So, Mike, how do do states with similar situations, small rural counties that don't have a lot of population, that have their own local tax base, how do they solve those problems? Have we given any study to that in other states and how they handle it? Uh, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. I would think that you might be able to do something regionally. We have we have regions for other things in West Virginia, um, you know, with our EMS systems and so on and so forth, um, that you may be able to do a, a more regional um, th- uh, type of system um, to accommodate those smaller counties that, that don't have the tax base. Um, and, and maybe that's the, the, how you, you do it all. But also... Maybe that's also how you reduce the administration, that if you do it regionally, then you have a regional school board as well and not a county-based school board, um, that it's spread out, your administration's spread out over uh, a larger area, and you don't need as many people um, because it's spread out. To to what Rob was saying, uh, if you're looking for a comparator, um, I would say look at a map of Pennsylvania north of I-80. It's, well, I've always, I grew up there and I've always referred to it as the West Virginia part of Pennsylvania because you have Erie on one end, Scranton on the other, and a whole lot of West Virginia like towns in between. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Erie's 100,000 people, which would make it the biggest city in our state uh, now. And Scranton's probably 75, which would also make it the biggest. But in between there, that's West Virginia. Um, it's, you know, the towns are getting smaller, they're losing population and they still run a fairly competitive on the terms that Joe is talking about education system. And it would be interesting to find out what the differences are and which one of them are making, uh, which ones of them are making a difference. Um, the, the differences are even structurally allowed is, is the difference with West Virginia. The teachers union has supported this one size fits all monolithic top down Charleston based world and that's why we're last. Jackie Long says county school systems can give a raise to employees but we don't have enough funding to give one that amounts to anything but that's because the current tax structure and the way it's set up. The counties don't get to get to keep all the money that they generate whereas they do keep most of their money in other states and then they have to maintain and that, and, that, and that's, that's why complete tax reform is really at the heart of a lot of government reform bill as a uh, county commission president formerly in regards to
county money that comes in. What kind of discretion do you have on funds given to the school system? Uh, the money that goes to the school system, there's, the county has no discretion whatsoever. 82% of the money collected through property tax goes to the schools. Uh, but it goes to the school via Charleston and doesn't go to the schools directly to uh, Berkeley County. And Charleston takes their cut first. Right? And tr- everybody takes their cut first. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the county, from the county's perspective, there's always some grousing, if you will, that they only had 18% to, uh, to run the government on. The other 82% uh, went to Charleston. Uh, but I'm going to agree with my buddy Mike Carl. Uh, there's so much of this is bureaucracy and trying to sort out what is legitimate and what is not uh, requires a deep dive. Uh, for everything you do in the bureaucratic world, you can justify it. Not a thing cannot be justified in one's own mind. It takes the, a third party a critical look, but you cannot look at just one part of it. You've got to look at it in total, and that has never been done. I don't think the State Board of Education is the one to do that. I come back and I say the legislators are the ones that need to take it. But it's not a trivial task. It's going to be a big, big, big job. You've been given an assignment. Hike, get on it, man. Yes, sir, Bill. <laughs> yes, sir, Bill. You can you can check with me for a list of nice hotels in the West Virginia part of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Casa de Ferretti. There's like two. <laughs> Bill, you're on the clock. Our crew on this fabulous Friday morning is uh, a via telephone. Joe, Joey, towards Ferretti. Good morning, Joe. Do we still have your connection? Yes, we do. Awesome, Larry Schultz. Good morning, sir. Great to be here. Michael Carr, how are you? I'm enjoying the Cardinals rally. They are doing well. <laughs> they are doing well. They'll probably still win the division, by the way. That's my goal. Okay. Your goal. <laughs> well, <laughs> as manager of the but Cardinals. But it just repeat last Virginia. season. You know. Yeah, they are a successful fran- model franchise of the National League. Yeah. And Mr. Michael Height. Good morning, Robert. Good to be here. We move on to issue number two, and for that, we stop at the Admiral's desk, Bill Stubblefield. And yes, Rob, I still have a connection. <laughs> You're very connected, sir. Yeah, I'm very connected. Uh, Rob, I'm, I'm going to do something different today, and hopefully it's fun. Uh, l- watching the Facebook chat, I'm amused about the labels that we're all given at time. Socialist, communism, right-wing nut, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> they have come up at one time or the other. It made me start thinking uh, how we view ourselves, and more important, how our fellow palinists, 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 I'll get it out in a minute. Fellow humans. View, <laughs> view us as well. So uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, I've asked each one of my colleagues uh, to be prepared to, one, identify how they view themselves on the political spectrum and also how they view others as well. I'm going to start with myself. Uh, and also, I'm uh, Alonzo Perry, who I think is a very important part of our uh, Friday family. I've asked Alonzo to wait in, which he has as well so i'll be reading his comments you want to start with alonzo first and then we'll go to you it be, might be a more natural transition we certainly can alonzo uh, um, uh, views himself first uh, alonzo views that traditional conservatism isn't designed to deal with the problems we face today right-wing populism is an answer to inherently elitist progressive ideology i haven't dissected that i don't have my arms around it but i have a lot of respect for alonzo and uh so his views i i'm not going to dismiss casually so i think he's a he's a very smart man uh alonzo views himself as a right-wing populist he views mike height and now there's a whole string of derogatory statements here <laughs> we can go on for, as there should be <laughs> yeah and we can go on for 15 minutes but in the essence no he, uh my alonzo said he views mike uh, height as a libertarian conservative he views mike carl as a reagan republican with as a traditional conservative he views me as a liberal leaning centrist he views joe ferretti as a moderate liberal he views Larry Schultz as an old school progressive liberal. And I think, in, in essence, he did a pretty good job of labeling this. Uh, but anyway, going back to myself, um, I am a physical conservative, but I'm more liberal in a lot of the social issues. And I find as I get older, I become more liberal in social issues, which is different than a lot of other uh, folks that get old. Uh, 
I, for much of my life, I was a registered Republican, uh, and I was proud to be a member of the Republican Party. But as the Republican Party drifted more to the right, uh, I was uncomfortable. And also the rigid nature. I, when I was a Republican, it was advertised as a uh, big tent. Uh, now, if you don't adhere to a fairly rigid line, you're a rhino. And that is not used in a flattery term. It's used as a derogatory statement. So uh, it's un, it was funny how many times I was called a rhino uh, when I was still officially part of the uh, Republican Party. Uh, I, I view progress should be made through compromise rather than through rigid uh, political philosophy. So in net, I think uh, probably Alonzo has me pegged fairly well. I think I view myself as a centralist. I try to look at a fairly broad spectrum, but if I had to label myself, I'm probably on social issues anyway. I'm slightly, I'm leaning to the, to the, uh, uh, to the left on physical issues. I tend to lean to the right. Uh, Going down my list, Joe Ferretti. Uh, I believe to be a moderate Democrat, but he's so polite, well-researched, and articulate on the issues is difficult to tell. Uh, Joe comes across as someone that uh, uh, takes a high road and, and uh, is, is fair as assessment. Larry Schultz, my friend with a beard, uh, is a man of great principle and whose principle are in the district of the hard over Democrats. He never wavers or apologizes for his principle, and I give him credit for that. Mike Carl is an unbiased and uncompromising conservative, especially in all matters of a physical nature. His openness in expressing his objection to a Democratic position is always honest and fun to watch. Especially that neck in his, that vein in his neck that gets <laughs> As up. he gets red and start, <laughs> eyes start bulging out, it's fun to watch. I'm not sure the camera catches it all the time. but you know, uh, uh, Alonzo Perry uh, is an unbiased and uncompromising conservative. And I, I do not have his right-wing populist. I just had the old phraseology. Uncompromising conservative. Especially in all matters of a fiscal... No, I'm sorry. Uh, um, Alonzo Perry never gives you pause attempting to determine which side of the political aisle he is on. If it's a Republican issue, he's supportive. If it's a Democratic issue, he is well-armed in his opposition. His engaging demeanor, person, uh, demeanor, however, makes it difficult to be mad at him. It's always a delight to political spar with him. No one loses. So high compliment to Alonzo. And also including Rob. When on one of his most entertaining Rob rants, yes. it, he is certainly a Republican. At other times, his good nature and intelligent questions make it difficult to pin down his political position. So that's my part of the uh, homework. All right, I'm going to put a checkbox next to Bill's Christmas bonus. There you go, Bill. <laughs> Checkmark. You got yours. You're good. All right. Uh, so, uh, Bill, I'll let you pick who you want to hear from next. And I'll exempt myself for purposes of uh, uh, time here. Would you like to hear from Larry as to what he thinks about you now? Well, I'm afraid. <laughs> let's, go with, let's go with Mike Height. I'm even more frightened. <laughs> All right, let's go Mr. Height. You have to praise yourself and uh, give an opinion of Mr. Stubblefield. Well, I'll try to go a whole lot quicker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Golly, Bill. <laughs> that was not a fellow buster. They didn't call him Rain Delay Stubblefield for nothing, you know. Uh, I, I consider myself a, a conservative, uh, especially fiscally, um, and somewhat moderate socially. Um, I think the libertarian um, probably suits me a, a lot, a conservative libertarian. Um, and I'll go around the, the room here. I, I think Mike Carl goes a whole lot farther right than I do, um, socially and fiscally. There's no two ways about that. And I would say Larry is just the opposite, that if <laughs> If Mike's drinking red Kool-Aid, Larry's drinking blue, and maybe even purple. I mean, it's deep blue. Um, so, but I think we need that on this show. I need. I think we need that perspective, and I think that adds a lot to this show. Um, so, uh, I would say, Bill, um, Bill. At one time, I believe you were a Republican. Um, I don't think the Republican Party left you. I think uh, that the liberal side of the, uh, old age is <laughs> is dragging you and not kicking and screaming. You're walking quite comfortably over to the liberal side of things. Um, I, I don't think you're nearly as far 
uh, left is Larry. Um, uh, you still have a, a common sense approach to things, so um, I would say you're <laughs> centrist, leaning, uh, leaning left. Um, and I would say Joe is is probably like me on the other side of the fence, um, more moderate, more common sense approach, um, probably fiscally conservative to a degree, but uh, socially uh, more liberal. So, um, Rob, you're you're I'm just the host. Uh, no, you're a Republican. There's no two ways about it. When the rant comes out, there's no doubt where you stand. So. Oh, I, I never – I don't think I've ever said anything otherwise. No, yet. no absolutely On numerous not. occasions That's said true. I'm a registered Republican. I'm just not a Trumplican. Yeah, well, agreed. Yeah. How about Alonzo? Alonzo, I would say Alonzo's that, that new Republican, that, that young, youthful, energetic Republican that has looked back into history um, about re- what Republicanism is all about. And um, he, he adheres strictly to that. Um, I'm also, you know, somewhat amused when I hear the term rhino. I've been called a rhino many times, you know, to the point that I actually went and looked at the the Republican platform just to make sure I am a Republican. And I, I, it seems like as you go down the, the, the platform, I check every box. So I'm like, how am I a rhino when I'm adhering to the platform? I think it's the far right people that, that consider people like myself to be rhinos. If you do not support Donald Trump on January the 6th, you are a rhino now. Yeah. Mr. Carl. Well, thank you. Um, am I supposed to re- – Assess your assess yourself. Myself, I, I, I'm certainly a, a conservative, but I try, try try to be open minded. But I really focus, uh, and 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 Bill talks in you know, the interplay between social issues and fiscal issues. Uh, there there's a big connection, and so I I, I try to focus on on the constitutional facts and and, and principles and perpetual and how and i believe that they can apply properly in today's world you know that i don't think that the the the, you know societal changes have changed the principles of the constitution so that's 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 how i view myself um uh larry and joe you know i you know from my perspective as part of a defense Council firm, I think of them as <laughs> sort of a package, but <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and one of my I like that one of my great old late partners, Richard Douglas, said, "God bless the man that sues our client or or our clients insured." <laughs> so, but but uh, they they are both very thoughtful, open minded, and and I really appreciate the. Uh, uh, thoughtful le- level of their you know uh analysis of issues and and so i you know i i consider them you know liberals and democrats but not in a in a mindless way i think they they have you know they assert as, as their as their profession calls for you know good arguments in favor of the policy positions that they take um uh, Alonzo is a, a you know new new in my life, but he he's a uh, I, I think he was well described you know as a as a the new Republican kind of uh, who who really in a lot of ways is focused on on the flaws of the other side, and and so I you know I I don't consider that that I'm more conservative than he is or than than Mike Height, but uh, that's that's all point of view i guess but but uh he, he he's he he's he has uh he, he he does a good job but he's a he's clearly a, a conservative republican and and of course so, so is mike and i really appreciate his thoughtful uh uh interplay on on the major issues and i most of the time except for the neo-isolationist part <laughs> uh support his uh point of view <laughs> and uh mr stubblefield here is is a, a a wonderful player in our you know panel and community and everything and and i he, i i would uh there, there's a there's a, a sort of a innate conservatism with him but but he uh 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 has these 
visceral tendencies to be liberal or 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 at least to start a conversation i think some of some of the stuff that he advocates is just to, to get the discussion going which i appreciate that certainly and and some uh, of it's just to get you going Bob. oh yeah yeah <laughs> he, he does a wonderful job of that. it's not that difficult <laughs> really yeah, i guess it's a, a easy uh, yeah. <laughs> step there but but uh uh i i i i, I think one thing I, my my suspicion is that I don't think he shares the same tremendous love of capitalism that I do. Get, get, even though he's done well in life, uh, it, it's a lot of it's in the context of of government, and and so I don't I I, I think that his questions about you know uh, regulations and stuff are. Uh, not as uh, well informed as are mine. <laughs> just, just to be blunt, I would expect you to say nothing less, Michael. Well, and and uh, uh, Rob, I really do respect your your uh, uh, insight into where all of us are coming from, and and your ability to manage this discussion. Uh, but but from a base of a very clear thinking relatively conservative person the key to the show is having the mute button by the way <laughs> uh, that's really where it all stems from uh damon right with the comment of the day i think there would be funny if we had a lie detector test going on during all this uh, <laughs> now for for purposes of time constraints uh, larry and joe I'll confine you guys to a minute apiece larry go first sure i love the middle class i watched the middle class get eroded from 1980 or so forward and we need to rebuild it and until we do, until the middle class is once again the thriving heart of American democracy, we are not going to be able to do that. You can rebuild the middle class while still encouraging people to, to go in their economic achievement beyond that. The problem is so many of the ideas that are brought up to gild the uh, warships of the uh, already wealthy uh, tend to hurt the middle class. And because of that, I, I, it's not so much that, uh, uh, even though I have always been a Democrat, it's not so much that I would choose that, but I see it as the only vehicle to get us back to the strongest middle class in the world, which we had undisputed uh, strength as that uh, for many, many years from before World War II on. And... That's kind of going away. And as we fragment, we're seeing the social uh, product of that. I think to stop it, we have to rebuild our middle class. Uh, Mike Height. I would not go is, around the room this okay. time because we, right. we just don't have time for it. Sorry, Larry. Joe Ferretti. Well, I, my gosh, if I was there in the studio, I would advocate for a group hug after all this. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll tell you, I, I, think, I think I've been defined accurately by those uh, in the room, and I, I respect and, and appreciate that. Um, I agree with Larry uh, because uh, in the job we do uh, as professionals, uh, you know, we see some of the ramifications of the erosion of the middle class, and we advocate for those folks in many respects. Uh, but overall, my, my philosophy is that neither side has a monopoly on good ideas. And the sooner we come to appreciate and respect that, the better off we're going to be as a society. Good statement, Joe. And uh, Jeff Haddix, i got to give credit for Joe uh, for, for a second uh, line here because uh, he says using the label rhino, going back to that term, is the far right's way of using cancel culture. And there is no more critical group of cancel culture than the far right. Yet the far right does it with that label rhino to cancel out Republicans who don't agree completely with everything Donald Trump says and does. And I know you're smirking at me, Mike. You might not agree. That's cool. That's all right. That's why we have five around the table. But that well, is, well, I, thought, I think it's a pretty accurate statement. Well, the, the, the idea that cancel culture is only on the right is absurd. No, it's not only on the right. No, 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 no. That's not at all what his statement was. Oh, I thought. He said it's the far right's version of cancel culture. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. And my statement was there is no group that is more critical of cancel culture than the far right. Yet the far right uses the rhino term to cancel its own Republican culture agreed so to speak all right let's move on to issue number three and for that we go to michael height all right my issue is about d 
Disney, and Disney just scrapped a $1 billion expansion in Florida because of the spat that they're having with, uh, with DeSantis. So my question is, is this going to hurt DeSantis in his campaign? I'm going to start with Mike Carl on this one, Michael. Well, it certainly was intended to. Sure. Uh, but if you, look, if you look at it, uh, there, uh, he, 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 he was simply uh, sending a signal that, that uh, Disney doesn't have the leverage despite their you know, incredibly large uh, p- position that they're in you know, and, and role they play in Florida to uh, pursue uh, you know, these woke issues. And, and, or to, to promote them, and that he's not he's he's not going to cave into that, and I, I I think that'll get him more votes than it'll lose him, absolutely. Billy, yeah, uh, there's pushback already. Both the Sanchez camp, including the mayor of Orlando, said uh, politics had nothing to do with it. His fight with the uh, uh, with with Disney had nothing. Uh, Disney's fight with DeSantis had nothing to do with it. It was strictly a corporate business decision. Uh, in this uh, recessionary times, they felt it better not to make the investment. That's going to be the political pushback. Uh, I and I like so many of the other things that we uh, we address. So many other issues. We have to think about two different timelines. I, I agree with Mike Carl that in the primary. It's not going to hurt him at all. In fact, it may boost him, uh, even though Trump's going to make uh, uh, try to make it, this an issue. In the general, though, I think a lot of these things are going to be hard to reconcile. So it's uh, every every election, a, a political candidate has to do a pivot from what appeals to the base to what appeals to the general. I think in DeSantis' case. And Trump's case, the pivot's got to be larger and more distinct than what it would be normally. Lawrence. Yeah, um, this is an interesting one for me because maybe unlike a lot of five- or six-year-olds, I never had much use for Disney, (laughs) right? Mickey Mouse and all that stuff. It always seemed kind of Mickey Mouse to me. I was much more of a Roadrunner, uh, Tom and Jerry, violent cartoon uh, fan. That explains a lot. Uh, yeah. And so we see uh, as as we go along that now Disney has become uh, a bit of an opponent to Mr. DeSantis. And I don't know, if I lived in Florida, I'd be a little upset that they were backing off on a billion dollars of investment. And they'll never convince me that economic conditions drove this decision it happened in a matter of months after he first challenged them and so they're like well if you don't like us so much then we'll maybe go build this new park in tennessee or or wherever and the number i mean they employ seventy-five thousand people in most places um a republican governor would be all about what they wanted next (laughs) and saying, I'll be glad to help you. DeSantis isn't doing that, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it shakes out with uh, Florida voters. I I would also note that for the first time in, I think, 30 years, the largest city in Florida, which I never knew this, but is Jacksonville, just elected a Democratic mayor by by four points uh, in in a general election. So that's an interesting thing, too, uh, whether the people of Jacksonville are a little worried that elsewhere in Florida, the governor's sort of driving Disney uh, to the wall. I, like I say, I, I don't even like Disney, but it's an interesting fight to watch. But, Larry, uh, we had a similar analogy in Virginia, northern Virginia uh, six months or so ago when Amazon decided not to build their large administrative structure there. Uh, so there is some substance to the argument that it was a corporate decision more so than a political decision. Mr. Ferretti. Well, except, Bill, that that Disney had already started moving people to the Lake Nona area where they were going to put up this office complex for a thousand of their employees. Uh, They were down the path of making this happen and pulled the plug. Uh, And now they got to move those people back. So, you know, that kind of lends itself to the argument that there was some politics involved with this. But for the life of me, I cannot understand 
the governor picking a fight with Disney. Uh, I think it just shows a, a lack of political maturity. I think it shows uh, what kind of campaign he's going to run. And, and Mike, Carl, I'm surprised at you that uh, a business that would deign to, to speak its mind about an issue would suddenly be the uh, brunt of, of revenge and, and you know, some kind of warlike politics on the part of a government official. Uh, I, I thought businesses would have the freedom to, to speak their mind or ha- advocate however they wanted. If you don't like what Disney advocates, don't go. But to, for, for a, a political leader in the state to take on the largest employer, I mean, imagine it would be like Governor Justice going after WVU, uh, hook, line, and sinker o- over some kind of issue like this. Uh, you just can't imagine that. But it's happening in Florida. And, and to me, I, I just – I think it shows a lack of maturity on the part of this uh, this uh, elected official. He's got to come with more if he's going to convince people that he's a better choice than Donald Trump. Well, Disney is not functioning as a, a free enterprise capitalist they're a entity. They're they're the, what he's opposed to is they're functioning as a as a woke advocacy political engine, and uh, they they have they already have as you know a huge presence in florida and in fact they have incredibly uh uh, favorable uh you know local government circumstances and you know where they where their big big facility is so uh they just got out of line that that's my perspective mike disney's been an advocate for the gay and lesbian community for for decades but the way Uh, they do it is another story but it's only this governor who has made it prominent and an issue. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, Disney, I didn't Disney is protests. supporting the woke agenda in the schools, and that's what's wrong. Yeah, I, I think that's what it comes down to. I, I'm going to agree with Larry and Joe. I, I think this is political in nature, that – that this this move was not just something new for Disney. They were moving out of Southern California to Florida because of the, the the tax laws and stuff in Florida. They were moving this operation from one state to another. The and and when you talk about DeSantis getting into a fight with Disney and that being immature, it was Disney that started this fight. It was Disney that got involved politically into laws that were being passed in the state of Florida and came back and made comments. That's how this all started. It wasn't by DeSantis going after Disney. DeSantis was reacting to the comments that that Disney was making. I think it's, it's interesting that Disney decided to make this move based on the financial benefits of moving to Florida and now has decided to move back due to political issues. Um, To me, if you look at the big picture, I don't think this is going to hurt DeSantis at all because if you look at the state of Florida, it is the number one growing state in the nation as far as businesses moving into and starting up in 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 any state in the nation so if you look at the big picture you would have to say desantis is doing things right and mike you get the final word since that was your uh that was it topic there and i would add this as well uh no one brought this up but i did hear it on the news this morning florida was offering 570 million dollars in tax credits to disney for the moving of those jobs into Florida. So it's not like Disney was doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. There, there was a massive tax credit available to them for making that move. So, Imagine that in a free market capital. Exactly, right? Huh. So while they were <laughs> apparently was the project was valued at a billion dollars, it was going to cost the Florida taxpayers five hundred and seventy million for the games played. For that as well. So it's not the point. But it was, but it was going to earn them even more. That's that's why yeah, the credits were offered. Correct. Yeah. Hey, uh, we break here and uh, come back with uh, Larry Schultz on the clock. We move on to issue number four. And for that, we go to attorney at law, Larry Schultz. Larry, you're on the clock. Yes. Well, Speaker Kevin McCarthy, having watched while the debt ceiling was raised without a fight three times during Trump's term, actually caused a default. 
And if he does, will historians someday mark it down as the day the R party died? Wishful thinking. <laughs> All right, let me go to Bill Stubblefield first. <laughs> <laughs> this one I wanted to be last on, Rob. <laughs> okay. No, no, I, yeah, that's true. I should give you guys a pass option if you want. Would you yeah. like to pass? Go right ahead. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, no, it will not be the la- uh, the uh, downfall of the Republican Party. Uh, I uh, and anything such as this, there is so much hindsight finger pointing and that it's any issue we raise there'll be folks to say you did not do this as a party when you had the opportunity uh what we need to do on these arguments is forget about what happened in the past look at the merits of what's happening now and to go ahead with that uh i uh, yeah uh kevin mccarthy did vote against the debt ceiling uh, all three times that trump was in office uh, but i'm not sure that's reason to to criticize he or anybody else for what they're going to vote this time. What they need to do is to get together and resolve this issue before we have a physical calamity on our hands. Mr. Ferretti. Neither the Biden administration or nor the Republicans in Congress want to own a debt ceiling collapse. So they're going to work out a compromise it's, and uh, it'll be announced here soon. Uh, it's going to be something that allows everybody to save face. It won't accomplish a whole lot, which is what we, we can expect out of Washington. But that's what's going to happen. Uh, it would be calamitous. Uh, and it actually, in an ironic way, would create even more debt if we would allow for a default. So uh, it does not make sense on many levels. It's just not going to happen. Mr. Carl. Well, it. In the past, there's always been compromise. Don't just talk about during Trump's administration. We're talking, you know, many t- administrations prior to that. It's it's always been a trade-off. Uh, we, w- but the only reason, the only way we'll stop having this crisis is to do the things the Republicans propose to do, or to start moving in that right direction, is to curtail wasteful spending. But isn't that in the budget process more so than the debt ceiling? They're two. If separate you don't issues. think there's two issues, no, no, they are, they're absolutely <laughs> connected. The reason there's that vein, there's that vein. <laughs> yeah, are did you, I punch that button, Rob? <laughs> yeah, you did. Are you kidding me? We 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 have uh, you know a debt ceiling crisis because our budget. Uh, expenditures have gone awry. I don't. I agree with that, Mike. I agree with that. But I, it's not because of our debt ceiling. Uh, raising the debt ceiling is the reason that we have a budget crisis. It is the budget process itself, not the raising well. It, the debt it, yeah. Oh, I I, I agree and, and, with that. I agree. There's a. And but the there, real problem is combining the two. Yes. Because you no. you're not making much progress on either one. You better pick this one. Get it lined up. And then go do your work. And that that, that uh, is absolutely irrational. They are absolutely related, and they ought to be combined. And the only way we're going to stop the one problem, the debt going up, is to have a budget reform. Let's look at the term debt ceiling here, if we could. Right? And we've had this discussion before on Fridays, Mike, in years gone by. I'm sure you recall. The debt ceiling is a false It's a fake number. Right. And it's a it's a fake term. It, it's only a real term if you adhere to a debt ceiling, which we never do. We just agree to bypass it. Right. Surpass it. Bypass it. And then we set another number that's far up again, a couple trillion away. So that we assure ourselves of another artificial crisis another year and a half down the road. And then we just play this game over and over again and never really get to the root problems of the game, which is the budget. OK. And the fact of the matter is, when it comes to the budget. The American people don't want the government to stop spending money. They don't. We, th- we think we want them to, but we really don't, do we? Because if the government stops spending money, it's going to affect you. Well, there's no it way is. in the world the government's going to stop spending no. money. It's how they spend the money. That's, a, that's what but, matters. But everybody thinks, well, for, well, when you survey people and you say, how much money do you think the United States We're spends about to get a rob on, go, rob. on foreign aid? <laughs> the answer is, uh, we, I think 10% is about what we spend on foreign aid. What's, what's the real number? About in a, in a typical year when we're not fighting 
uh, the Russians in the Ukraine, about 1%, 2%. It's, it's much lower than people think it, but people think it's 10%, so we can cut there, right? Nobody wants their ox, their ox gourd, right? I almost mixed a metaphor. I'd have been on my own intro. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants their ox gourd. They don't, right? And take a look at this area around here. Why do you think the eastern panhandle has grown besides I-81? It's the fact that the federal government is just down the road spending a boatload of money. Look at Northern yeah. Virginia. They, Look they at used Montgomery to talk County. about the Virginia miracle, and the it's Virginia miracle. miracle was right there on the map all along. It's, well. that, it's, that, the, it's that Maryland ceded land of the District of Columbia 200 some years ago. That's the miracle. Well, I'm just so forget where, where the money for ID1 came from. Yeah, it came, well, it came from Bob Byrd and the federal government, right? But that's that's the thing. We all say we want the federal government to. You got to rein in your spending, but how? Well, not not things that it's going to affect me, but the stuff that's going to affect those people those other people right well it, it, but when the if the federal it, government it, adheres to a strict budget it affects everybody does, does everybody want to make that are sacrifice? you trying to nullify the significance of how you spend the money no not in the that's least what it sounds like. but there's not that much discretionary income in a federal budget to be able to nullify that money mike what percentage of the budget budget is actually discretionary take out military spending but the Social congress Security, has a discretionary over every dime Social security and medicare Okay, well, that's... Right? Yeah. So How much of the budget? Well, as, as a Social Security It used to be 17% yeah. was purely discretionary. That's, and it's yeah. probably that yeah. or a little less now. So when it comes to that 17% or whatever the actual percentage is today, that's where you've got to make all your cuts because how are you going to touch Social Security and Medicare? Oh, I, I, how are you going to touch the Defense no, Department? I, I agree mechanically. There, there's, there's limits right? and, there, and there's areas where you need this so where the season when you go into made. a national park to go do your camping or go visit whatever you want to spend 100 bucks to get in no you want to you know if, if you if you operate in the honor system you throw your two your five bucks in the envelope in the little stand that doesn't have a person working there <laughs> and you and if 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 you're on the honor system you do that but let, let, why, why are we wanting to spend uh, you know tens of millions of dollars more on the irs when they're incredibly incompetent and inefficient and they're Unfortunately, administering an absurdly uh, uh, complicated system. Let's say well, I had a I had a bank make a mistake when my wife cashed out some savings that she had. They checked the wrong box, and because of the short staff at the IRS, it took me two full years to get them to correct this this box and file it. You know, I couldn't get the bank to move. I couldn't get the IRS to move. Two full years. I thought I was going to have to sue. Well, the, the, oh. ban the banks are big bureaucracy. <laughs> the, the IRS is even bigger. Right, right. So they need more IRS. But would they they hired agents to go to go to your house and and confiscate your stuff? They didn't hire more people to to do the the adding putting things in and and clerical well, we, stuff. We had a, I, I think we had did. a ballooning federal yeah. budget problem before the IRS was uh, asked to hire several thousand uh, new agents. So even if you yeah. took the, took away every single one of them, it doesn't solve what it our just, budget it, problem is. It makes is. it worse. That's the point. Doesn't, yeah, it certainly doesn't help. But, <laughs> but I think there's a labeling problem, Mike. I don't think all the IRS are agents going after someone's home. There's going to be a lot of analysts. There's going to be a lot of folks just processing the stuff as well. And there are some numbers that said it would save the money, uh, save the government several, several hundreds of millions of dollars. Sure, that's how you sell it. it. Well, yeah, but there's legitimacy to it as well. Uh, Larry Schultz just gave an example a second ago. I would have I would have killed to get somebody actually to speak to me on the phone and say, look, pull it up. I got one copy. You got the other copy. Here's the box they checked wrong. Just do just what you got to do to check the other one. I think let's the, get this over with. I think the problem with the debt ceiling is I think there's two things that happen in government almost annually. You have the debt ceiling that's around springtime that we have to go vote on, and and everybody holds their their breath, and that's where the right uses leverage and the the left uses leverage and it's to see who's going to blink first to see what we can get across i want this i want this and and we're using the debt ceiling to see which one can get as much as they can and in the past it seems to me at least that the republicans always blink first the other thing is is shutting down the government. It seems like always in this, around December, we're talking about we need to vote to, to fund the government, and we're talking about shutting down the government in December because it's another issue that we come to almost every year about whether or not we're going to fund the government at the levels we're currently funding them, and it's the same thing. It's it's one side digging in against the other, and, and who's going to blink first? And it but, seems to me like it's always the Republicans that blink first this time 
it seems like McCarthy's holding the line. But the point you're making, Mike, and do without saying it, there are two distinct parts of this equation. There's the 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 budget process, establishing the budget that gets very little attention with the general public. It should get a lot of attention. That's where these things are laid out. What gets attention is a separate thing, a separate element, and that's a debt ceiling itself. And that's easily understood, and that's where people get involved and engaged. They should be engaged in the much more important part, and that's establishing the budget but, itself. But to Mike's point, it's it's the first one that causes the second one. So it's it's that we, we have to, to, in order to keep the government going, we have to raise more we have to raise the budget and we have to put all this extra stuff in there um that that a, a, a lot, and and I'll say the republicans are just as guilty as yeah. as the democrats a yeah. lot of times but you put all this extra stuff in there so you don't shut down the government and then come springtime you have to raise the debt limit to try to yeah. To, to account for that. The debt limit should be a discipline, a point of discipline for Congress as they set the budget process. It is not. People tend to ignore the debt limit. They don't tend until to. They it, ignore it. They do ignore it yeah. until it cycles again. But, the but it is, should be a point. It should be discipline. We, we don't have a, a balanced budget amendment nationally. We have it in the states. We have it. But nationally, there's no balanced budget. So there's always spending more than what our budget hey, allows for, and and then we have to raise the debt limit. I want to get to back to Joe Ferretti here for a second before we go to Mike for issue number five. Joe, comment time. Well, I, I get, yeah, I, again, I, I just think that uh, this fight is, is political theater. Uh, they're all going to do the kabuki dance until they come to a compromise. It, it, there's not going to be a default. Uh, I think, actually, statements issued as late as this morning indicate that the sides are not going to allow a default. It's just a question of what compromise they can work out so everybody stays face. That's a, that's eventually going to happen here in the next few days. Yeah. Having having a debt ceiling you don't adhere to is like having a credit card limit of five thousand dollars, and when you reach it, you get another credit card for seven thousand yeah. dollars. Right? Yeah. Mike Carl, issue number five. <laughs> uh, what in the final Durham report exonerates the political bias behind the FBI's Russia collusion investigation of Trump? That's a question I'm laying out there. I throw it out there one more time. I need to better understand that. What in the final Durham report, this came out, Mm -hmm. exonerates, affirmatively exonerates, the political bias that was behind the FBI's uh, collusion investigation uh, with Russia and Trump? Gotcha. I'll start with you on the phone, Joe. Well, the Durham report was critical of uh, some components of the FBI for uh, jumping to conclusions and not having the rigor and professionalism that we would expect of the FBI in conducting an investigation. Very simple. Uh, On July 31, 2016, the investigation of the FBI was opened on the Trump-Russia collusion question. That is three months before the election. These folks hurriedly tried to conduct an investigation Some of the investigators, certainly, uh, I I think it's been shown, might have exhibited through their emails and private messaging that they had some political bias. And they produced a very, very poor result in the investigation. They should be uh, punished for that. They should maybe lose their job. There's been no criminal charges coming from the Durham Durham investigation. So it's just an agency that, that failed in its mission to investigate without favor or without uh, bias. And uh, you ferret these people out, get rid of them, and you continue on with the FBI. The argument that we should suddenly defund the FBI is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. It's just, again, uh, a political uh, rhetoric that really serves no purpose at all. But, uh, look, the bottom line is there, there was enough smoke there to investigate. They just did it in a poor manner. Larry Schultz. Yeah, I um, I believe that nothing um, exonerates these people. Look, he brought two. He's a prosecutor. He brought two criminal cases and lost them both. To me, it bears about the same amount of driving force as continuing to believe after they lost sixty some uh, civil cases. 
uh, that there was somehow a problem in the 2020 election. They didn't get anything proved. And if they didn't prove anything, why should we assume that there's a finding of any kind? Um, If you say that the FBI organized as a huge group to deny Donald Trump his rights, I'm sorry, it sounds too much like the election fakery that we heard about uh, after the 2020 election. He didn't prove it. He's a prosecutor. He had a chance to prove it. He got one guilty plea to some guy he who didn't tell the truth. He absolutely proved what we already knew, but confirmed that there was an extreme political bias, as 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 Joe has agreed with me on, and, and so uh, 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 behind the FBI uh, investigation of Trump collusion. So the so, the uh, efforts by FBI agents to enact their political values. Uh, through their daily work is not a crime it wasn't it wasn't a crime proven beyond a reasonable doubt it wasn't but, but, proven but it, at but all abs- it was proven absolutely as a fact that they acted on political bias i don't bl- i don't believe that it was bill's okay, double so field. you're denying bill's double field yeah as an organization fbi has made some major mistakes political mistakes uh they uh they did it with hillary clinton uh, they waited in at a, at a most inopportune time for, for Hillary Clinton, and I, many of us, myself included, felt they swayed the election. So they made a mistake there. They, they made a mistake, I think, with the Trump as well. But the thing with the Durham uh, report that surprises me and disappoints me, 300 pages without any recommendations without any recommendation at all. They threw some stones, but they did not give a single suggestion of how to improve the process, how it could be improved as an agency. Mr. Height. Well, I don't know that that was the purpose, is to, to find out and improve the, the FBI. The, the FBI, the, the report shows that the FBI did not follow their own protocol, their own their their own policy of how you investigate um, a, a, an issue, and they jumped to conclusions. They they took evidence that normally they would have discredited and not used, and used this because there was political bias at the very highest level of the FBI. Now, do I think that translates down through the rest of the the agency? Probably not. I think there were probably three, four, five bad actors at the very top of the FBI, and they took this and ran with it because of the the political expediency to to get to somebody that they all disliked. And if anything, was it criminal? I don't know. That that remains to be seen, if there's actual criminal activity here. Um, but there have been changes that have been made in the FBI since all this took place, even before this report came out. Final and, word goes back to you, Mike Carl. You, Bill, you can. I got a minute, so if you. Have no, some I was going correct. to say uh, 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 we cannot divorce it from what happened or the early, earlier political cycle. I, with I Hillary, don't disagree with Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I uh, particularly appreciate. Bill's comment about the the need for more specific recommendations for uh, uh, you know improvement and to avoid that and and but 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 the fact the fact that it was exposed it didn't you know it didn't prove something you know a violation of criminal law right. but it yeah. but it proved a violation of of good public policy. There's no question the FBI's reputation has been harmed over the last several years in this country. And I don't know how long it's going to take them to get some of that back. We need Elliot Ness back. He was the Treasury agent, wasn't he? Yeah, but un- he was. Is yeah, it, but uh, FBI is under the Treasury. Well, there's no doubt they've influenced the, the past. Hey, get two your elections. final thoughts together. 